Hello, my name is James Alderson, and I'm going to do another devlog. This is the third devlog on the Thetis blockchain. I've come up with a name for the blockchain now for the whole project. And we've added a few things to the blockchain, so we'll go check that out now. Just waiting for the app to load. Shouldn't load any second. Here we go. Okay. So here's our app. We had what we had before. We have adding blocks, which is done whenever any transaction or any action occurs on the blockchain, and we'll add a block. We have C, so we can see the blockchain. We can do that now here and look at the whole blockchain. There's 30 blocks on here so far. These are all just me doing things, testing out different tokens and everything like that. And you can see that every single one of them along the way is true, 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 true. So this means that the functionality is still working after all these different kinds of transactions and different actions on the blockchain. We still have it working all the way back up to wherever the Genesis block is. It should be up here somewhere. Here's the Genesis block. <clears throat> so this was the first block ever created. We can look at the whole blockchain and every transaction. So... There will be an Explorer application eventually for this, I imagine, that will be able to see the block. So where were we here? <clears throat> okay. So we can make wallets, we can load which wallets we currently have on our machine, load up a wallet into here. Type wallets to see the current available wallets. If I do that right now, it won't bring back anything because I haven't loaded any wallets in at the moment. Uh, to complete a transaction, type transact. So type token to create a new token. So there, that was the first kind of token that I made, which was just a generic token. But now we actually have the ETS implemented, which is the Elastic Token Standard. So to test ETS, type ETS. So we'll test it first here to look at it. I was had this done to some degree before. And this will do... So today all 10 of the top coins if you were to add them all up and take the average that is 74,593 and 21 cents American dollars the initial price of our token is then 10, 000, 1 ten thousandth of that so 7 cents and if we had a million dollars in here is what this is saying then the value of each token would be 74 dollars it would then generate this amount of supply and then adjust the token uh, price to be in, li in, a li uh, in line with this supply. So that's all fine and dandy. That's working as we intended to. Uh, I explained this in the last one, how that actually functions and how this Elastic Token Standard will be the main token on the ETS network. But I've already implemented, you can add other kinds of tokens here. So we can now create an ETS token and that's what we're gonna do today so we're gonna first of all we got a ETS token enter the name of the token we'll say it's a test token for now enter the symbol of the token test enter the value of the token so this is actually gonna be done automatically but I'm just doing this for test purposes right now we're gonna say that it's uh, one dollar per token to start off with the initial supply of the token. Again, this will be done automatically, but I'm just doing this for now. So let's say we have this many, whatever that is, 100 million or something like that tokens. The token have fixed supply, false. Again, this is just for testing purposes. This will all be done automatically, and I'll go into that in a bit here. Enter the initial token holdings. Let's say we had $10,000 in there at first. Enter the address of the token owner. So here, I'm going to go, this is one of the two wallets I have generated. This here you can see has no token contracts at the moment, no ETS contracts at the moment. But this is the one that we're going to use. So we'll go to rename. Again, the name of each text file is actually the token address that I have compiled and put onto my machine locally here. And we'll go into that more in a bit too. And there we go. So this should have created a token right here. 
token creator is this guy, token ID, and block number 31 was added to the blockchain, and it was valid true, it was signed by these two wallets, which one of them is the, um, the recent block was signed by two people doing a transaction. This one actually will only be signed by one person, which is the creator of the token. So when I actually create the final version of the token, there will be a token wallet, a token address for that wallet that will always be the same token. But this is just, I'm, I've created several versions of them for testing purposes. So we go over here and we can look and see what is actually going on after the transaction. After <clears throat> the transaction has been completed and the information has been filed as proper. All that stuff I was doing with the one and the 10,000 everything actually doesn't matter because the calculation overcomes that. But I was doing that for testing purposes when I was before I had implemented the ETS standard here. So our token ID, this is now the token ID. And the token wallet holder is going to be this address here. So you would transact with this token ID for this wallet. That's how it would work. Token name, test, token symbol, test, right? The, the value of this token would be 74 cents with the holding and everything that we have. So then it would generate a token supply of 1 million or 134,117 tokens. And then it would replace the balance with that. And then the token holding here is, a, let's say there's $10,000 USD. This is what would it would equal out to. To keep the liquidity, it would have to generate this amount of tokens for this amount of money. So that's that so far. We'll go back to our app here. And we'll just reopen it again. Um, so we'll type transact ETS. Enter the name of the wallet you would like to send funds from. So there's only one currently, which is the owner of the token here. Which token would you like to send? Test. So this in production will actually be the token. You'll put the token ID in here, actually, not test. But this is for what we're doing right now. We're just using the token name. Enter the address of the token that you would like to receive funds in. So we'll check here. Again, no token contracts, no ETS contracts at all. We'll rename this. <clears throat> we'll place that in here. Amount of the deposit, we can put any number in here. We'll say 1,500 tokens. So here we go. Here's the transaction that occurred. Transaction was successful from this wallet, the owner sending it to this wallet which is the receiver the transaction amount is 1500 a new balance in the wallet is this and the new balance in the wallet of the other wallet is 1500 so it took that much away and if we go and look into our other wallet here we should have 1500 all oh, this is going to be null it doesn't have token value token supply or anything like that because all that matters when in the, in the receiving wallet is the 1500 because when you do a transaction it calls back to the main token here where it still has all this information here and this is going to be recalculated every time that a transaction occurs every time a transaction occurs it's going to calculate this over again and then distribute a number of to tokens with those values into every other wallet so that's fine and dandy okay so that's what we've added so far. We added the ETS token in theory of how it's going to work. We've seen how to add them. We can look at the ETS calculation method, and then we can also transact between them, which then uses the calculated method inside of a token that's been generated. So we can exit the app. <coughs> Okay, so that's that. So let's talk about the whole vision for this now. So this is just some rough thing I threw together in paint or whatever. To talk about what's next for building this because we're gonna start trying to actually go to production soon. I gotta build some an actual application 
for this whole blockchain project. So that's the next step after I implement encryption. So encryption I'm working on right now. And then once encryption is done, that will be added to the wallet application. So let's just look at here. So this is what I'm working on. The wallet manager application is what I will start work soon. This will have localized wallet encryption and encrypted blockchain assets, which what is an encrypted blockchain asset? Encrypted blockchain asset is similar to an NFT. NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Basically, it's just pointing at an address somewhere. So I have, let's just do a little bit of a drawing here, I guess. I have the blockchain here, let's say, and then I have the token, which can, and then here's my link somewhere on the internet. And then the NFT is added to the blockchain and it points to here. And then whoever owns this right here, whoever owns that, it's a receipt saying that they have access to this. They're the owner of this. So they're, this ledger here says that I own this, whatever it is. It's just a little picture of a, of Mario or something. I don't know. Uh, an ape, whatever the hell they're using in NFTs today. Okay. So that's that for that. So what an encrypted blockchain asset is, if we had that same structure, we have the blockchain, you have the ledger pointing at something. That thing that it's pointing at on current NFTs isn't actually encrypted at all. Anybody can go to that link. I can go to the link and I can go and copy paste that asset and do whatever I want with it. There's no actual protection there. All it is is a ledger. It's a receipt saying I own that thing doesn't actually protect that thing. So that's what I'm doing with encrypted blockchain assets. Is it'll be essentially the same thing. There'll be an NFT, a non-fungible token, that points to an asset, but that asset will actually be stored locally and it will be encrypted. So nobody can access the content of that asset unless you're the owner and you have the the symmetric key, the, e, the AES symmetric key to unlock the thing. So that adds a lot of value to the whole concept. Um, what NFTs are supposed to be, what blockchain is supposed to do. It's supposed to keep things protected and safe. <clears throat> but with NFTs right now as they are, that it doesn't actually do that. It doesn't actually protect anything. It just points to something that says, I own that. But sure, I could have a paper receipt that says I own that and I can show everybody my paper receipt. The difference here is that the thing that points to that says I own this thing that is encrypted and protected. And the only person that can touch that information is the person that has the key. So that has a wide variety of applications. Of course, you can just do what NFTs do now and do art, randomized art and stuff like that and put it out on the blockchain. And then that, you know, instead of just pointing to that thing, it's that nobody can actually look at it. Like if I'm an art gallery, I actually own the original artwork and I can display it on a screen in an art gallery, a digital art gallery. And only me, because I'm the art gallery, can display that on the screen. Nobody else can touch that information. That's one way. Another thing that would be very useful is notarization of documents. So notarizing documents is very important, especially with official documents, uh, text documents, things like that. This would actually offer what they said that the whole blockchain thing was supposed to do and to offer this this ledger of events that I can trace back and say this person did this, this person did that, and that they actually have signatures. Like if I was a government official and I signed a document, that's my actual signature. That's how I confirm that I've had it in my hands and that I've approved that document. Well, this would offer a digital way of doing that because it's an encrypted blockchain asset. The actual asset is, is has been encrypted and then put onto the network. And nobody else can touch the content of that net, of that document except for who has the, the current AES key. They'll unlock it, and then, so that AES key, so what could happen is it could be transferred, right? One person could encrypt it, let's say a government encrypts it, sends it to another division of their government, and then they decrypt it with that key and they can read the document. But if it gets intercepted in transit, nobody can touch it. It's just gibberish. When you open the file, it'll just be gibberish. So that's the that's the idea of the encrypted blockchain asset. It could be used for artwork. It could be used for documents and books and stuff. That's something to come that I will talk about later. 
It can be used for music and sound files. It can be used for video files, whatever. It, this encrypted blockchain asset could be whatever kind of file. It's just an encrypted file. So there's a lot of potential there, right? Uh, that's one major idea that I'm trying to do with my whole thing here is to have encrypted blockchain assets and localized encryption, which oddly enough, none of these wallets out there actually do localized encryption at all. It's, ju it's just type your password in. There's no authentication. There's no encryption. It's so easy to hack a wallet. If you, you know, if you hack a network, you can get access to everybody's stuff on the wall. There's no second layer of encryption. there stopping you from taking funds from these wallets. So that's the whole thing about the, the wallet manager application will actually manage your wallets. It'll all be localized with local wa localized wallet encryption. And this encrypted blockchain assets thing also uses the same localized wallet encryption algorithm that will be AES. I'm not making this algorithm. I'm just using AES 256, which is an existing encryption algorithm. So that will be managed in the wallet application. The only person that has that can access your wallet and everything, because it's all encrypted gibberish files on your computer, is this wallet manager application that will access stuff from the wallet. So nobody can look at the files, the assets. Nobody can open up your wallet file and look at like these here. These will eventually be encrypted. Nobody will be able to open these because they will just be encrypted hidden files on your computer. So that's what the wallet manager application is going to do. The wallet manager application communicates with the Thetis PDP network, node network. So this is what I'm also working. I have to work on all of these things, but this is just the vision, the long-term vision. The Thetis PTP node network, Thetis is the name that I'm calling my, my blockchain here. This will be a bunch of these wallet manager applications, and they will all be in a PTP network using WebSockets, and they will act as nodes, like as if JavaScript nodes. I might use JavaScript. I might end up needing to use JavaScript to do this, but I might be able to do it in C Sharp. I don't know. There's two ways of doing it, so I've been looking into what the best and most effective method to achieve the node network is. But in theory, all these on local machines all over the place will communicate with each other like a PTP node network, similar to like BitTorrent, the way that was, or LimeWire and these other applications that existed in the early, in the late 2020s and early 2010s in that area. So Thetis will operate in that way. The blockchain is on, is in here. It's actually inside of here. Every single wallet manager will pull down the JSON file, the encrypted JSON file, decrypt it. And then if you do transactions, it's actually, this communicates with the network. And then the network says, oh, okay, what's the other wallet? Oh, you're communicating now. Transfer the things over to that other wallet. And so that node network will be the primary function of the blockchain itself. That's how it will work that's how you'll be transferring files and transferring data between each other is on the node network so then that has an authentication layer right all three of these things actually have the OAuth authentication layer so unlike other blockchains because of DeFi and anonymity and everything like that they haven't actually implemented any form of authentication o OAuth authentication layer and that's because they want to remain anonymous and they want people tracking the transactions everything like that the difference with what I'm trying to do is that in theory, you could track the, the information if you were like a government or a tax agency or something like that. But that's not the point. The point is that I'm actually trying to create a security layer for this whole blockchain thing, for these encrypted files, for this wallet manager application. There will be an OAuth authentication layer so that nobody can get in here. It will be two-factor. You can't get into this unless any of these things into the Thetis network, into anybody's wallets, into the localized encryption. You can't get there unless you authenticate your identity. And that's just the way it has to be. It has to be this way if you want network security. There's no network security on block on blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum. That's why people get ripped off all the time. I've been ripped off in the blockchain space and that's why I thought about some of these ideas was to create a more conducive environment that people don't get ripped off and that there's a bit of a sacrifice of yeah, you have to use your real identity to do this. But because you're using your real identity, this affords you more privileges with authentication and cryptography that allows 
your files to be safe, that allows your information to be safe. And that nobody can touch these files, nobody can get into your wallet application, it's all more secure. So anyways, back to the whole thing. Theta's P2P node network communicates with an authentication layer and then this allows you to, when you sign into your app, it goes to the authentication layer, it says, oh, this person's this person, okay, right on, you're allowed into the wallet manager app. And then going this way, this is buying ETS tokens. So here's another idea that's new to blockchain to some degree. So the whole thing about blockchain and these cryptocurrencies out there is that apparently they're supposed to get mass adoption. Oh, mass adoption is coming. It was supposed to happen already by 2020. There's supposed to be mass adoption. And guess what happens? Because these are isolated protocols, most of the blockchains are isolated from any kind of real world currency system. There's no way for you to automatically liquidate your let's say you have ethereum there's no way for you to sell off your ethereum right now all of it and just buy something or just buy something with ethereum right you got to find a liquidity provider you got to find a centralized exchange in order to sell it and there's all these hoops to jump through and the thing about all these hoops to jump through is that you lose money along the way there's gas fees along the way there's transaction fees these people take service fees and you lose hundreds of dollars I've lost hundreds of dollars just trying to transfer around my Ethereum when I had Ethereum. I lost hundreds of dollars just trying to, I wanted to sell off and wanted to sell it all. And I lost hundreds of dollars just trying to do that. And the reason why is because of the way it's set up, that everybody takes their cut and there's several hands along the way. So what I'm suggesting here with buying ETS tokens is that there's actually a PayPal holdings account that again, it's through this authentication layer. So there's no way for me to get here unless I use my name, my identity, and I actually confirm it to get into the PayPal holdings account. So people can't hack the PayPal holdings account. You actually have to communicate through your wallet with an authentication layer to get here. So when you buy these tokens, I'm actually taking real money. So there's a PayPal implementation here that takes, let's say USD will be the first, even though I'm a Canadian, I'm gonna use USD as the currency and I will eventually try to bridge into other currencies CAD yen whatever it is euro um, Australian dollars whatever it may be I'll try to bridge into those start building reserves of all of those because the whole idea is that when I buy some of these tokens the amount of money that I have is put immediately put into a holdings account so that money always exists there's money in here I'm not buying and selling from this account. This is just a holdings account that has the current value. And then if we look at the token again for a second here, I think I have one open, don't I? That's not the right one. This one. So this value here, token holding, this is actually going to be coming from the tokens from the holdings account. So when people buy tokens, it'll go into the holdings account and all these will be recalculated again based on how much money is in here to always keep this amount of money here liquid so that if I buy the tokens the amount that is in here is always in here it can go up it can go down but you it guarantees that if it went down to the very bottom which probably won't happen but if it did happen you could still get 100% of what you put in originally out through this methodology and so that's the whole idea is that when I buy the tokens, I'm making a swap in a PayPal holdings account for USD. And now I've got X amount of tokens. Let's say $500 I put in. Now I've got X that's worth 500 at that point in time. And it puts it into my wallet. And then if I want to sell it to an external account, again, we pass through the authentication layer. We go to the PayPal holdings account. It trades off my tokens, puts them back into, like, puts them back to the holding wallet on the network sells off for this amount of USD in here and then takes that USD and immediately deposits that into account or so using this whole functionality that I'm thinking about here this would actually allow for this whole mass adoption and actually being able to use your tokens in the real world because it automatically will go and sell it off there'll be maybe a small service fee yes like all things have to take service fees but I'm not jumping multiple hoops it'll be one Thetis network that provides a bit of a service fee to upkeep this network and then sells off. So it's like, what? It'll probably be 10, 15 cents, I imagine, that it would that you would have to pay for service fees 
to be able to actually sell off and go to the store and hey i have this thetis token i want to go to the store and buy groceries i can just actually use my app go to the paypal holdings account and just liquidate the amount that i need to trade for real world assets and that's what is different uh, that's what will be different about this that a lot of blockchains that are out there right now don't actually they can't do that you know like there's some companies like tesla that was going to accept bitcoin and dogecoin for a while but guess what happened as soon as they said that they went back on it because if we look at it we can go to the internet here if i wanted to i have a facebook open here so that's not good I'll open a new google chrome here so if we go and look at bitcoin uh history chart So we're going to look at the, the history of Bitcoin here. So it's worth 70K right now, which is, you know, it's gone back up to its value or whatever. I don't care, whatever. Use your cookies. And then we'll go all time. I don't, get on the fucking ads and stuff. Okay, so this is back when, when Elon was talking about, oh, well, let's fucking use Bitcoin and Dogecoin. They were at highs here. Then it went down a little bit, then it came back up again. But then they turned back on it about here because guess what happened? Boom, 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 boom. It sold off. And like, if they were to accept Bitcoin here, then they would have lost millions, maybe billions of dollars because of how low it went during this little recession here inside of the Bitcoin value. Of course, it did come back up. It's up here now. It's higher than it's ever been. Again, right? But... The fact remains that this is going to happen again. These bear markets where there's huge recessions inside it and you lose, like, if this is the 50% line, you're losing 50% of your value this way. This is 50% going up this way. Imagine that if you're a large corporation and you're trying to implement these currencies into your corporation so that you can sell it to sell products to people and receive Bitcoin. There's times where you're going to lose all of your money basically at least 50 percent of it in that holdings account because it's too volatile and that's part of the idea of the whole thing so back to my little example here so they didn't actually do it because of that whole fluctuation in the market the idea here is that the whole reason why i'm doing this inside the code here and go down to the end and i'm taking these currencies and then i'm doing my little averaging calculation here taking the average and doing that and figuring out how much a token should cost is because i'm trying to avoid that volatility i'm taking all of them i'm using it as a metric the base the bottom line and then i'm also taking into how much do i have in my holdings account and i calculate that and that avoids that volatility that they're having because if it goes down blah blah and it goes all the way down to zero loses 50 percent, whatever you want to call it this token holding still has all the money that's ever been put in and I can still sell off at what I put in for the most part, right? I can, it, it, all, it has 100% liquidity. So the money that I put in is safe in the holdings account and I can sell it off for the same value I bought it or more because it will go up. As people put more money in, it increases as an economic vehicle selling that off to external accounts and then being able to use this functionality here where I buy some, it's an investment vehicle, I can then sell it later and buy stuff in the real world with it. That's the whole idea of the blockchain that I've come up with here that I'm gonna be working on. So to recap, we'll start from here, the wallet manager application. Wallet manager application has localized encryption and encrypted blockchain assets that are held here. So all of the tokens, everything, and all the encrypted blockchain assets are going to be held at a local level on your machine inside the wallet app manager application. This wallet manager application communicates with the Thetis P2P node network. The Thetis P2P node network is like a BitTorrent or like a LimeWire or something like that. It's a WebSocket network between several different applications. Each one of those applications has localized wallets that contain all the information in it. The Thetis P2P network then uses an ETS token standard on it 
to communicate with a PayPal holdings account for buying and selling these ETS tokens. When you buy and sell an ETS token, it comes off the network, it goes directly into your, your localized encrypted wallet, and it's th then there for you to utilize. You can then trade on the PTP network between wallets. You can trade your tokens, you can trade these assets, but the buying, the purchasing of it is gonna go through a PayPal API to a holdings account. Buying, buying them over that way as well as selling them to external wallets and external accounts outside of the network it will be it will be converted back to USD initially and eventually into other currencies and even cryptocurrencies that will that trade with the PayPal holdings account when they trade with the account off of the network if we said let's say there was ethereum or something bitcoin and they trade with outside of the network they would buy some of these tokens and it would be put in the amount of USD that's worth would then be added to the holdings account but that's in the future. Originally, it will be USD, and then I'll try to make reserves of other currencies as people in other countries, if they want to utilize the network, that will happen in the PayPal holdings account side. Again, this is all through an OAuth authentication layer. Selling tokens to external accounts does not utilize, it's after you've passed through the authentication, let's say. So it authenticates, and it says, oh yeah, this person, he has this much, and on the holdings account so he can sell this much to usd and then use the usd in the real world for whatever you want you're using usd you're using cad you're using euros australian dollars whatever it is in the real world and that's basically the gist of it it implements a few different features that i don't see currently in the cryptocurrency market which is full of grifters and scammers and the idea is to kind of overcome some of those things. There's a bit of a sacrifice of this anonymity, which I'm a big anonymity person too. But when it comes to finance, if you really want safe funds and you really want to keep your, your money safe and have an investment vehicle that grows, you have to have some layer of authentication in today's world. And this is the safest way to do it because the authentication, I'm not doing it, I'm providing it through OAuth, which is its own authentication layer. I'm not writing this code, I'm just gonna plug into it with a URI. I'm just providing the Thetis network, the wallet application, localized wallet encryption, and a PayPal holdings account. And the authentication is done through third party providers, two factor authentication, to make sure that it's you, so you can't get ripped off, ever. There's too many layers of security here for you to get ripped off. There's no way that they can hack everything. They can't hack the OAuth and then hack the wallet and then hack the encryption standard. There's no way for them for anybody to do that. So basically, it's kind of the idea of having a centralized exchange in your own wallet. That you don't have to jump hoops. You don't have to go to crypto. You don't have to go to Coinbase or Binance or one of these providers because you're already authenticated. You could hook up your bank, you could hook up your Google account or Facebook or whatever, you know, have, and utilize that, your Google Pay, your Facebook Pay, your Apple Pay, whatever, you can utilize that to go directly to PayPal and just liquidate your, your funds at any point in time. That's the whole idea, to get away from the traps that they have, the, the way that they're grifting and making you jump through hoops and go... You know, I have one wallet and I got to go to this provider and I got to go to this guy and I got to pay fees along the way, all the way. Okay, so that's one thing that I forgot to talk about here is that this whole idea here, if we go back to my blockchain and I look at it. So each one of these things has happened already. And as you can tell that there's no fees being sent to anybody else, right? That's because it's a gasless wallet. And the reason why it's gasless is because it self mines. There's no miners there. Now to achieve this, what I'm doing is I'm only doing one transaction per block, which a lot of people might find strange because why would you have one transaction per block? Don't you have thousands of transactions per block? But the thing is that's what creates the need for the miner here. So instead of doing a proof of work, that's what the mining is about, proof of work. So basically they're saying, oh, well, it's secure because I have to do this amount of algorithms and I have to calculate this much stuff. And that's computationally expensive. That takes up energy resources. And that's why they're considered mega polluters or whatever. It's because 
of how much energy resources it takes to actually calculate these blocks on a blockchain like Bitcoin or something or Ethereum. So my way of getting around all this is that each block actually self-mines. There's no miners involved. Nobody's mining it. It's just that it verifies itself by the last block, the last block, the way blockchains work. And it's just, and it, it doesn't even have mining technically. Like it, I would say it's self-mining, but it doesn't even have mining implemented. There's no mining here. And where the proof comes from then is from this whole system here of the authentication. So it's proof of trust over proof of work. I know that I can trust it because I'm using OAuth, which is a trusted authentication provider. And I know I can trust what I have in my wallet because I'm using AES, which is a trusted cryptography standard. And I'm putting that into my, I'm using that on the network. So this network thing is, maybe people won't trust me yet in the beginning, but the thing is I'm using all trusted services and I'm just providing a network, a node network between them to communicate and the PayPal, another trusted network to provide liquidity and to do financial transactions in USD. So there's no mining involved in my blockchain. There's no, and because there's no mining, there's no gas fees. You don't have to pay gas. Every time you do a transaction on Ethereum, let's go here. Let's go to Ethereum gas right now. Let's see what the gas fees are right now. Uh, gas track or whatever. So GUI 177, that's way too low. Here they are right here. Okay, so here's what it is about here. So right now, and this is actually a low, low gas fee because it doesn't seem like there's much network uh, activity at the moment. $31 between $27 to $31 is for high speed. This is for it will take you like 10 minutes to do your transaction for a swap for an NFT. It's between $46 and $52. And for borrowing, it's $23 to $26. So that's the gas fee right now. This is how much gas that I have to pay these fees per transaction. So this makes it completely unviable for smaller transactions, of course, because I can't if I want to send fifty dollars, I can't pay set twenty seven fucking dollars to send fifty dollars because I'm losing f more than fifty percent of what I'm sending just in the gas fee, which is ridiculous. And that's one reason why I like I wanted to get uninvolved with it for the longest time is because of those gas fees. So the way that I'm doing here, there's no gas fee. There will be network fees, small network fees, because when this network is up there, and it's going to cost money to maintain the network. I'm sorry to say it. Fifteen dollars, fifteen cents, ten cents, something like that, probably per transaction is all that you will need for this PTP node network to maintain itself. If there's hundreds of transactions, then that's you know, or thousands or millions. If it got the millions of transactions, it would easily be enough to scale up and say, okay. Here's my fees if you're using virtual machines or something to maintain the network, to pay those providers for the usage. And that's all that that's all that I'd be asking for. I'm not asking for tens and maybe hundreds of dollars. These those fees, this is low fees again. This has gone up to eighty, ninety dollars when I was back when I was trying to use Ethereum network. It would be ninety dollars sometimes especially for the NFTs. I was trying to sell my NFTs, my artwork as NFTs. And again, $90, it never happened. People didn't even want to pay the gas fees. I was trying to sell for $100, let's say, and $90 is your gas fee. So it's $10 actually, because the person that's buying it has to pay $90 out of $100 to sell something. It was ridiculous, it's ludicrous. So no mining means no gas fees. It also means that because this is all local, because the PTP is just between a couple wallets here and there, it says, oh, talk to this wallet, do the transaction, add it to the thing, and then put it, put your tokens on each wallet or whatever. Because that's happening at a local level and there's no mining and there's nothing like that, it is very energy efficient in comparison to the other blockchains that are out there. I can run, the way it is right now, I can run this thing on my computer in like seconds, right? compared to oh 10 to 15 minutes like the way it is right now i can say c i could say ets ets takes a little longer 
because I have to calculate. I'm communicating with an API, but that took like what, 15 seconds, 10, 15 seconds. And that used no energy on my computer. I guarantee you that was nothing. And that's part of the whole idea, right? These transactions, everything that's occurring will use barely any energy. It's not as computationally expensive on purpose, even though because I'm using these other standards to achieve security where I can obfuscate how much my actual network has to has to do on its own. And that's the whole idea of proof of trust. So it's proof of trust, not proof of work, not proof of stake, proof of trust. I'm trusting these guys. I'm trusting AES. I'm trusting the Thetis network. And through these other things, this is the right person, the right identity. This is an encrypted file that nobody can touch. And because of that, I'm taking away the need for any mining, any proof of work and extremely expensive on the computers and using lots of energy, energy inefficient. I'm getting rid of that whole thing. So that was kind of a lot to go through, but this is the basic idea. Um, I recapped once already, but I went into other concepts. So yeah, in the future, I'll be working on the encryption layer. And once I have the encryption layer done, then I'll be making the localized .NET MAUI application that will communicate with all these different services and provide this whole chain of events. So that's it for now. That's the devlog. That's the vision for the future. Uh, I'll do more updates. I'll update again when I get encryption implemented. And then maybe I'll start working on a rudimentary MAUI app just as a proof of concept. And we'll see how that works. All right, that's it for now.